This is the Free Church Podcast. We're so glad you're taking time to listen. We want to see people live in freedom and with purpose. So please contact us if there's any way we can help you. Absolutely brilliant. I'm excited uh, to be here with you this morning. I'm excited that you're here. Well done uh, for showing up on the 24th of December at the end of a year that many of us would like to see the end of. And we're looking forward to 2024, the year of more and uh, all that that holds. And now we get to celebrate Christmas. One of the things that I love about Christmas time is mince pies. So guess whose idea it was that we should have mince pies on Sunday? But I know that this can be divisive, right? Because usually in a family or a household, there's some people who love uh, mince pies and Christmas cake, and then there are others who absolutely despise them. So I want to know from you who are the mince pie and Christmas cake people. Can I hear a shout out from you? Yes, yes, I'm with you. Okay, And, and for the rest of you? That's okay. I'm okay with that because I know that if you don't have, there's more for me. So I was excited we get mince pies today, but now we don't because the shops had run out of them because of all the other people who love them. Some of you are excited, but we can, most of us could agree that we like ice cream. So that's a, that'll do, right? So when you leave, when you leave, the ice creams will be at the door and you can grab some and there, there'll be some for your kids, those with kids as well. And uh, in, in June of this year, um, those of you who, who have been part of the story for a while, you will know my mom went to be with Jesus. And um, in December, when we used to go down to KZN, she would always have a Christmas cake ready for me when we arrived. And I was so excited because most of my family doesn't like it, so I'm like, this is just for me. And I was thinking the other day, man, when, when we go down to KZN, um, you, you know, I'm not, there's going to be no Christmas cake. But then, on Thursday morning at sunrise prayer, and, and this, is, this is why you should come to pray, because God does amazing things. We had the prayer meeting, and we do that every Thursday. Our next one will be on the 11th of Jan, so we'll start again every Thursday at the church office, and we overlook the city and and just pray for you and pray for the city. And uh, an angel arrived, and out of his car, he brought a Christmas cake, which his angelic wife had baked, and said, this is for you and Amy. And I said, well, that's just for me. Amy will have to find (laughs) something else. And I was just like, man, this is amazing. God is in the details, and I I was just uh, so encouraged by that, that prayer meeting. Now... I know at Christmas time, there's, a, there's a, a lot of people around the city, not just in this church, maybe in this church, but in fact, all around the world, this is a moment where people who don't usually go to church come to church. And in fact, it, it happens a couple of times a year. Christmas is one, and the other one is Easter. So it's a, you, you get a, a people who come to church on Christmas and Easter only. CEO church attenders. Christmas and Easter only. And if that's you, I'm so glad that you are here. And maybe you got dragged here by a family, like you came to visit, and they're just like, just, uh, we're just going out for a while. Come with me. And you find yourself in this room, and you cannot wait to get your ice cream and get out of here. I just want to let you know that I, I'm glad that you're here. And, and probably if I knew your story of why you do that, I wouldn't blame you. Because the reason why you may only go to church twice in a year, like for the, the really big moments, Perhaps it has something to do with along the way in your church and faith experience that you encountered someone who said that they follow Jesus and said that they love Jesus, but the way that they interacted with you and dealt with you kind of left you feeling like, I'm not sure if they actually know Jesus. And you, you, you got hurt by someone to do with the church and Jesus, and something happened in your faith journey. So you've gone, you know what, I'll go for the big events, but the Sunday to Sunday thing, I'm not sure about that. And, and if that's happened to you, if that's been your story, I, I'm really sorry, because I, I don't think that's the heart of what Jesus would want for you. Or maybe the reason why you do that or someone that you know does that and and just as, you know, kind of in in and out of church once or twice a year, maybe not even at all, is because the way that the gospel has been explained to you or to them has gone something like this. Well, what you have to know is that, that you're a sinner and God is angry with you, so you better repent of your sins. And if you say this prayer, you're going to get your name into the Lamb's book of life. That means that you're saved and you get to go to heaven. And uh, you do that, but you have to keep all the rules. So you do that, and you come and check in at Easter and Christmas just to make sure that your name is still there. But, you know, like the, you put in the minimum to see. But because you have this sense in you that everything you do is not quite good enough. It's not quite good enough to satisfy God who's angry with you. So this is just like a check-in to come and, and, and see how it's going. And you, and you live with this, this sense that there's something in you that doesn't quite measure up to the level that God expects of you. 
And following Jesus sounds like a whole lot of hard work and a whole lot of rule keeping. And that may have been your church experience. And, and if that is you, if that's your story, or if you know someone like that, then I hope that today encourages you and brings some freedom to you. Because I, I don't think that that's what the story of the gospel is about at all. And I think you're missing out on so much of the grace and the mercy and the compassion of a kind and generous God. And I, I think one of the ways that the enemy of heaven loves to distract and discourage us and, and make us feel this burden is, is by getting us in our faith journey to have the sense that we always have to try a little bit harder, to strive a little bit more, to put in a bit more effort, just so that maybe we can get a smile from God, maybe just a little one. And if any way this relates with you, then I, I'm believing and I'm trusting that today is going to be something that's helpful for you. At least th this is my prayer. And if you've been hurt by the church or someone in the church, or if, you've, if you feel like God is angry with you because of something that's happened or because of something that you've done, then I pray that today brings some freedom into your heart. Because the true story of Christmas and the spirit of Christmas is, is one of hope, like we've been singing about this morning. It's one of grace and compassion and mercy and forgiveness. It's a story of God making the first move towards you and towards me in the midst of our brokenness. This is what we get to celebrate. And it's easy to get a little confused and, and a little mixed up in this season because there's so much hype around Christmas time and it seems the whole world kind of goes crazy for all the, you know, the magical elves and, and the man on his sleigh and the reindeer and the snow and the snowmen that Amy told us about a couple of weeks ago. It was last week, I think. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's all these, these other elements that come into the Christmas story. And it, honestly, it can, it can make us miss the essence of what this story and what this season is actually about. So today, what I want to do is something perhaps a little unconventional, and it's maybe not the, the typical or the traditional Christmas passage that you have been expecting, but I, I want to go to a passage of Scripture that's in the Old Testament, and, and this is perhaps an unlikely Christmas passage. But what this passage is, is a... It's a song that was sung by the ancient Hebrews. And they would sing the song every, as one of a collection of songs, every time that they would go up, three times a year, they would go up to the temple to worship and they would sing this song. And the reason why they would sing the song is a, as a reminder to themselves. It's, it's kind of when you sing a song, it's a declaration of you, it's a reminder to you. They would do this to remind them of something that was coming, of a truth that was coming. And they sang this song about the Christmas moment, but they were looking forward like a thousand, 700 to 1,000 years into the future. They didn't know when it was going to happen. They didn't know how it was going to happen. But they would sing this song, and they would encourage themselves. And for us, we get to look back on the Christmas story, and we sing songs about what has happened. And they were singing this song looking forward. So they lived in this tension where they had an idea that, that something was going to change, something was going to happen they just didn't know when it was going to happen or how exactly it was going to happen, but, but they would sing the song together and they would encourage themselves. So they lived in this tension, as do you and I, which theologians would call the now and the not yet, where there's some elements of truth that are true, but you haven't seen the full revelation of the truth yet. And they were in the same place. So go with me to Psalm 130. It's one of the 15 songs of ascents, and they would sing it as they went up to the temple, and when they got there, then the priests who were leading the procession, on, there were 15 steps in front of the temple, and on every step, they would recite one of these songs, and they would declare it. I'm going to read it to you, and then we'll unpack some things about it. Psalm 130, verse 1. <clears throat> Out of the depths, I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord. More than watchmen, wait for the morning. More than watchmen, wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord... His unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. And just in case you're wondering, that verse 8, the last one there, that's the Christmas link, okay? Because what happens in the, in the New Testament, in the book of Matthew, and in Luke, in the first chapters, in Luke chapter 
uh, 1 verse 68, it's Zechariah's song, and he's talking about how God has arrived to redeem his people, and that's what, this is the link to the verse, where it's talking about God is going to do something to redeem his people, and it also shows up in Matthew chapter 1, which is, uh, it's the angel speaking to Joseph, and the angel is telling Joseph about what's going to happen to Mary, and saying, she's going to have a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he is coming to save the world from their sins. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord, verse one, Lord, hear my voice and let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. In the, in the ancient Hebrew, the, the way that the words were recorded, like in the earliest of days is they would use pictograms. And pictograms were kind of symbols of the letters. And this word depths is made up of four letters, amak. And the, the symbols of the A, M, and the Q basically mean this. It's an it's a eye that sees, waters, and humility. So the picture of depth here is something that goes below the surface to see the troubled waters underneath, but there's a spirit of humility attached to it. I don't know if you've ever prayed a prayer or, or had this thought or been in a place where you feel like you are in the depths. Maybe this year or a moment in this year or what you're facing currently now or something that's happened in the past has been that moment where you feel like you are in the depths. Like in the, in the pictures of the, the pictograms of the Hebrew, like you are in the troubled waters and this is a cry to look below the surface. Of, maybe it looks calm on the surface, but underneath there's chaos. Maybe it, it's the waters of your soul that are troubled and it's in this place where what the psalmist is doing is, is he's going, hey, God, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a bad place. I, I'm in the depths. I'm in a, in a dark place. I'm in a place where I feel alone, where I feel troubled. And all of us have had these moments where we feel like we are in the depths. Maybe you're in that place right now. And the depths, it could be because something has happened to you. Maybe a calamity has happened and you've lost someone that's close to you. Or you've got bad news, a bad health report from the doctor. And that's it led you to a place where you are feeling in the depths. Or maybe it's something, there's some inner turmoil in you. It, is you've done some things or some things have happened to you and it's put your soul into a place of chaos. And when you look, when, when you kind of pull back the covers and you look into the depths of your soul, you just see chaos there. And a lot of us, we just want to close that thing up until the point where it gets too much to, you know, everything is just busting out. And that's where this person is. Starting at this place, God, like, I'm in the, I'm in the lowest of the low, in the darkest of the dark places. And one of the things about being in the depths and maybe you're there right now, is you have a choice to make, is you can either allow being in the depths to drive you toward God, or you can allow that chaos and calamity to drive you away from God. And, and many of us, if we find ourselves in that place, we make this choice and we say, well, we get so angry with God because of the situation we find ourselves in or because of the things that we've happened or, or, or the things that, that we don't understand. So instead of running to God, we run away from God. And my encouragement to you is if you find yourself in that place is, is to cry out to him like the psalmist does. Whatever it is that's happened in your life, whatever it is that you're dealing with, is, is don't let that be a thing that pushes you away from God. No matter how broken you feel, no matter how dark and desperate you feel, it, it, let that be an invitation where, where you run to God and you cry out to him. He says, God, would you be attentive to my cry for mercy? He's crying out for mercy. Did you know that God is merciful? I mean, I don't know if you've ever jumped into a pool, like a rock pool or a dam or something, and you've tried to reach the bottom and you couldn't reach the bottom. You're like, I wonder how deep this is. That's a, that's a, it's kind of like a, a little picture of God's mercy is you cannot touch the bottom of God's mercy. And if you find yourself in a place of brokenness and in a place of hurt and pain, and, and you, this is the cry, I, I want to let you know, I want to remind you, I want to encourage you that God has a pool of mercy for you that you can jump into and you will not be able to ever reach the bottom of that. That's how deep His mercy is and His compassion and His love for you. It, and it's never His desire that you would be in that place. But if you will lean into Him in that, He can use that as a, as a moment to, to let you experience and encounter His presence in a way that you would not if you didn't have to walk through a place of whatever the depth is for you. And maybe for some of you, the, the depths, that dark place is not a situation, it's not, it's not something that's happened to you. Maybe it's that you are faced with your own brokenness. And I don't know all of you, I know some of you, but I know me and I live with me and I know my brokenness. And I would guess if you're anything like me, you've got some brokenness. And there's some stuff in your life that you don't want people to know about. And every now and then you get faced with that and you confront that. And it, to you, it feels like chaos. And maybe that's the depths for you. Is there's a revelation like, oh my goodness, God, it's, it's getting really bad now. And there's a, 
There's a something there that you are faced with, and you know it's there, and God knows it's there, and you've trying to be hiding, hiding that from him for a while, but you get to a point where you say, you know what, I'm, I'm actually gonna take the lid off and cry out to God about that. And this could have been what the psalmist is facing. Is maybe it's not an external circumstance, maybe it's not a, a loss, maybe it's not bad news, but, it, but maybe it's being faced with the reality of your own brokenness and your own shortcomings and failures and the narrative in your head that I wish I could just be better. I wish I could just deal with this thing. I'm sure other people don't have this issue. And it's in this place is the invitation to cry out to God. You see, Christmas is so much more than just a get together and enjoying good food and, and celebrating the birth of Jesus and thinking back to a time long ago where there was a baby in a manger. But actually it impacts your life today, if you will let it, through those moments of pain and difficulty in the depths. And the psalmist, he, he goes on to say, and he says, um, if you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there's forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I don't know if you've ever had this idea that you, you look at your life and you reflect and often at the end of the year, it's a time to look back and reflect and, and you think, Amy and I were talking about this year, the other night and, and just reflecting on the highs and the lows of this year. But in the moment, sometimes things happen and I, at least I find this and maybe you do too, is, is you have this idea, this thought that God is, is kind of watching your life from the sidelines with a pen and a book, the record of sin, right? Have you ever felt like that? Like you do something like, oh my goodness, I hope God didn't see that. Well, like, of course he saw that, he sees everything, but you're just hoping that he didn't notice that one or that moment or that failure. And, and you, you, I mean, I had this for a long time. Like you imagine God sitting there and he's like, right, he's keeping score of your life, okay? And he writes down your sins. Does anyone want to share a sin this morning? A recent one? Any? No? Safe, safe space, people. Nothing? All right. We'll just be generic. Sin and give it a number. Sin number one. Road rage. Road rage. There's a, was that this morning? The roads are quiet. <laughs> surely, surely there was no road rage this morning. Well, it could have been. Anyway, okay, road, sin number one, road rage. Yes, got it, all right. And you know enough about your life to be able to probably fill up this whole book. And part of what drives your faith journey is an attempt in you to deal with these things by doing good things. Because you imagine that there's a record of all the things you've done wrong, so therefore you must do some things to make up for the good things so that you find favor in God's eyes, right? I mean, many of us believe this. And even if you don't believe that, people that you know that don't follow Jesus think this is what you believe, that there's a good list and a bad list. And the point of this faith journey is to do more good things than bad things. And the psalmist says an incredible truth in this verse. I mean, think about his words. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, who could stand? And yet I, and perhaps you, have this idea that God keeps a record of your sins. And that one day he's going to call you to account for all of the things. And you know the, the, the cool thing about these books is they have this little, do you know what this is? So what this does is this little piece of carbon paper here. When you write on one page, what it does is it puts a copy onto the second page. <laughs> Didn't anticipate fans on the stage this morning. So you write sin, road rage here on the first page, and that carbon copy puts it onto the second page. When you come to Jesus and you put your faith and trust in him, what happens is all those sins and your rebellion towards God in your heart get torn out of the book and thrown away. If you, Lord, kept a record of sin, who could stand? And yet this is what I do and this is what you do is you keep this copy for yourself. So who are you to keep a copy of your sins when God has thrown it away? And how much pressure does that put on you? In those moments of failures and that moment and that indiscretion and that thought and that action and that decision and that thing that happened. And what you do is you look back on all your sins and you think that God's got the copy. 
And the truth of Scripture is that the Lord takes your sins, in fact, He nails them to the cross. And do you know why you struggle in your faith journey? Because you keep a record of your sins. It's not God that keeps it. And when you keep a record of your sins, what the enemy of heaven does is he comes and he reads your sin book. So the way to break free of this is to take and apply the blood of Jesus to your life and say, well, I'm also going to take my copy of my sins and I'm going to be done with that too. And when you do that, then the enemy has no grounds to accuse you on. He doesn't have a record of your sins except for the ones that you keep and agree with him about. And I'm trusting that this Christmas something is going to shift in you, that you walk out of here and you, you had perhaps a, a record of sins that you've been struggling with maybe for years. And today something shifts in you and say, God doesn't keep a record of my sins. Why am I keeping a record of my sins? In fact, I don't need this book anymore. I can throw this whole thing away with you, God. If you kept a record of sin, who could stand? Not one of us, which means every single one of us are the same. The ground is level before Jesus. But this is the invitation. But with you, there is forgiveness. So all those sins, all those wrongdoings by the blood of Jesus are dealt with on the cross and thrown away and discarded. And I just feel like today's the day for some of you to lay that down. And what better time to do it at Christmas, which is the story of when Jesus made the first move to come and be the one who pays for your sins so that you can do this and live with freedom. And here's, here's where it gets a little bit deeper in the faith journey, because some of you have heard that. Okay, I realize I'm a sinner, and now I have to say a prayer, and that will get me into God's good books, and I can go to heaven one day. But the psalmist doesn't stop there at the forgiveness of sins. In fact, he goes on a little bit, and he says, With you there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. And you see, when you believe the first part, it's really good. But it's only half the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus forgives your sins to set you up and to live in a place of freedom where you can, with reverence, serve Him. So this idea of, well, you know, I've said the prayer and one day I'm just going to end up in heaven, like that's like really bad theology. It, it's only half the story. So you might say it like this, that what Jesus has done, He's, he's set you free from a whole bunch of stuff and He set you free for a whole bunch of stuff. It's kind of like he's, he's settled your debt with his finished work on the cross, and now he's given you an open bank account, which is abundance for you to go and do something. And RJ said last week about seed for the sower. It's kind of, you've been saved not just to escape hell, but so that you can live in the kingdom as a representative of Jesus. And this is the point of the Christmas story. This is the spirit of Christmas. It's about forgiveness and grace and purpose and freedom. It's about these moments of, thank you, thank you. It's, a, it's about not living in a moment of despair and wondering what on earth am I here to do? Like if you follow Jesus, you, you have a purpose and that purpose is to serve God with reverence. Galatians 5.1 and 13 are shaping verses for this church and 5.1 says it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. Therefore, do not submit again to yoke of slavery. Don't pull the book out again. It's been thrown away. Your sins have been dealt with. But don't use that freedom to serve the flesh but use it to serve one another humbly in love. That's serving God with reverence. And you go, well, I, I like this part, but the next verse, and I'm with you here. I wait for the Lord. Who likes waiting? <laughs> no one. <laughs> Especially those with the road rage this morning. Thank you for being honest. <laughs> I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in His word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. I wait for the Lord. And you know, the reality is we can, we can grab a hold of that forgiveness truth and the purpose truth, but the waiting thing, when the Israelites were singing this song, it was 700 to 1,000 years before Jesus came. And they were singing this song every time they went up to the temple, three times a year, they would sing for years and years, for 1,000 years, singing about something that was to come. And a couple of things about waiting. Waiting reveals the motivations of your heart. I mean, those of you who've got kids, you've probably had some conversations through this year about um, what your kids want for Christmas, right? And, and those things will change moment to moment, day to day, and depending what store you walk into. And you go into a store with your kids and they want everything. And you go back to another or to a different store and then they want everything that's there. But th there'll be probably one or two things in that list that keeps coming up because there's something in there that they, they really, really want. 
And over time, what happens when you're in the waiting is it reveals the motivation, it reveals the deep desires in your heart. And, and for every single one of us, there's a desire, like this guy that's in the depths is to be known, to be loved, to, to allow someone to get below the surface and see what's really going on in there and to be in that safe place. That's a desire of all of our heart. And the temptation is in this season is, is we, don't want to, we don't want to be in the waiting. We just want to make the horrible feelings go away. So we turn to the hype and the busyness of the season and all the things of, of Christmas and we get caught up in that trying to make ourselves kind of feel better. The psalmist says, I, I wait for the Lord. And it, it's not a restless waiting. It, it's not a a doing nothing, waiting. It's an active watching, waiting, waiting on God, waiting for His promise to come, waiting for, for, for what He said to come to be. And here's a hard truth about following Jesus. And this is, where, this is where we can get things a little mixed up sometimes, is we believe a message that when you come to Jesus, you have forgiveness of your sins. Yes, you, you have eternal life. Yes, things are gonna be easy. No. And those of you who follow Jesus for some time, you've figured out, like following him, it doesn't like just bring all this happiness and solve all your problems. In fact, the point of the power and grace of the Holy Spirit in your life is so that you can endure the pain and the waiting, not escape it. And many of us, we pray prayers that God, would you just take the pain away? Would you take the suffering away? Would you help me escape the, the waiting? Would you just do it now? But uh, so much of our spiritual formation, and this is the reality, when you read through the pages of the scripture, what you see is this is a waiting game. And in the waiting between when God says something and it happening, that's the moment where spiritual formation happens. And none of us like that because it's painful. And who likes waiting? But we have to trust that this is the moment where God is revealing and dealing with your heart and bringing the, the motivations of your heart. And, and our culture is just like, hey, instant gratification. Let's get everything that we want right now. And, you know, if it can't be delivered, if it's three, three to five days delivery, what? Who's got time to wait for that? But friends, waiting and following Jesus go together. And the way that we get through the waiting all depends on where you put your hope. And the, the psalmist says, I, I put my hope in the word of God. In his word, I put my hope. In his word, I put my hope. More than watchmen wait for the morning. I don't know if you, any of you have done some night shifts before. Not all nighters, night shifts. <laughs> I've done both. And in time gone by, my brother-in-law started a security company and it was a startup, so he needed cheap labor. So he, he put a few of us through the security guard exams and we did night shifts as security guards in the startup phase and we got to guard potato fields in the farmlands. I tell you what, they, I understand. Watchmen waiting for the morning, we're like, it's 10 p.m., it's three past 10, it's five past 10, and there's nothing there but you and the potatoes. And maybe a couple of read bugs. Seven past ten. But about four o'clock, the sky starts to lighten. And you think, maybe it's now. But those of you who have watched the sunrise before know that like from when the sky begins to get gray, it's still a good couple of hours before the sun actually arises over the horizon. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Here's the thing about it. Is even though the waiting is tough, there's a confidence in you that you know the sun is going to rise. There's not a question. And this is why, as someone who follows Jesus, and if you follow Jesus, this is why you can wait in the midst of the depths, in the midst of the, being in the darkest place, in the midst of the biggest tragedy, you can wait with hope because you believe in his word. So when you, when you believe in his word enough to take away your sin and to deal with that and to set you up for purpose, then you've got to know and trust that the word of God is powerful enough for your life to be an anchor that you hold on to. And you have a confidence in you that you know it's going to come. And this is why you, you can be in the midst of, of a prayer. And you know the, the prayers that you pray to God, they don't expire. It's not like you pray them and, and he's just forgotten about it, but he's attentive to your cry. And those prayers that you prayed for, the things that you're trusting for breakthrough, they are still before him. And the sun will come up. But you might be in the waiting. And a whole lot of your faith journey of following Jesus and of mine is learning to wait well to be in this place of, of the now and the not yet. Like, they, like the ancient Hebrews were, God has spoken something, a Messiah is gonna come. 
700 to 1,000 years later, Jesus arrives. They were in the now and the not yet. They didn't give up singing. You, you might be in a place now where you're trusting God for a breakthrough about something in your life. And God has spoken. And the, the sun will come up. But it's in this place that, that you wait well. So, so how is it that you wait well? Well, first of all, you have to have a word to hold on to. Because if you don't have a word, then what happens? You get caught up with the hype of a season like Christmas time. And you use all the excitement of the things that are going on to fill that void inside of you. So what is your word? What is the word that God has spoken to you? What is your word? If you don't have one, I'm going to give you one in just a moment. But, but think about this. The words that you hold on to for your life ultimately will shape the things that happen. So if you... I listened to a message from Bill Johnson the other day. I thought it was brilliant. I'll paraphrase it. He said something like this. If, if you spend um, more time watching the news than you do holding on to the Word of God, then the despair and discouragement that you find yourself in is a self-created problem. I mean, I think we could extend that to social media. Like if you spend more time drinking in everything that's happening on social media than you do in the Word of God, then whatever it is that you're dealing with and feeling is a self-created problem. So the fix of that is to find a word and to hold on to the word. Because the word is a confidence that the sun is going to come up. And that's what gets you through the waiting. Because the word of God is true and it's powerful and it will accomplish what he has sent out to do. So what is the word that you hold on to? And what do you do with that word? I mean, have, have any of you ever, probably not in this room, but have you ever been kept awake at night by a thought that has troubled you? So much that you couldn't sleep. I'm sure it doesn't happen here. I'm kidding. I think all of us, at some moment, we've had a thought, a something, a problem. And we lie there at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, and it's just going, it's round and round your head. And it's just, do you know what that is? I mean, technically, it, it, it may be like rumination if it's about something that's happened or, or a fear and anxiety that's gripping you. But, but really what that is, it's meditation. So all of you, you know how to meditate because you know how to think about something obsessively and all the time. So the way that you get through the waiting and the way that you wait well and you take a hold of the truth of the spirit of Christmas and this story is in the midst of your pain because it's not all just, you know, happiness all the time. We know that. We've lived through the past couple of years and seen how tough it's been for many of us. But when you have the word to hold on to, and what you do is instead of the thought keeping you awake at night and, and that's just rumbling and rattling around your head, is, is you take the word of God and you put your attention and focus onto that. And you begin to meditate and speak the word of God over your life. I said in the beginning that the, a city, a city is literally is, is built up, it's exalted by the blessing of the righteous. So when you speak well over a city, the city is built up. And because you're created in the image of God, your words have incredible power. So if there could be something that is kind of a, a small gift from us to you over this Christmas season, over this time, is to help you reframe what are the words that you're speaking and what are the thoughts that, that you are fixated on and begin to replace them with the Word of God and begin to meditate on them and begin to speak them out, the promises of God for every single area of your life. And this is the way that you get through the waiting until you see the breakthrough of God come in your life is you speak the promises of God. And it's not just like taking your Bible and, you know, putting some highlighters and passages. I mean, we do that, right? You have the verses in there and underlining this one and that one. But, but it's in the moment where you feel discouraged and where you feel despondent, where you feel like the enemy is, is trying to get this book out again, remind you of some stuff. It's in that moment that you take the word and you speak it out. And you let it be the meditation of your heart and the word of you, the confession of your mouth. And you say, actually, my sins have been nailed to the cross. Actually, I'm forgiven. Actually, I'm free. And you speak that out over your life. Actually, the Lord has not given me a spirit of, of fear, but one of wisdom, self-control, and a sound mind. One of the words that I have over my life, it keeps coming up, and I have to remind myself of this, to meditate on it. It's, it's in Psalm 1, and every now and then someone sends a word, hey, I was praying and I just thought, and I want to share this verse with you, Psalm 1, verse 3. But that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields fruit in its season and, and whose leaf does not wither, and whatever they do prospers. 
And in those moments where I feel discouraged and feel like hey, nothing is going according to plan, just come back to this. No, this is what God has said. Whatever you do, prospers. Whatever you do, prospers. And if you're stuck, if you're struggling, you need a word for your life. And if you don't have one, let me give you this one. Out of Psalm 130, verse 7, 8, the Psalm that we had today, put your name in there. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. Whatever your name is, put it in there. Put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love. And maybe that's a declaration for you in this season, is that God is unfailing love. It doesn't matter what depths you find yourselves in, the, the love of God for you is unfailing. And with Him is full redemption. Full redemption. I love that. Full redemption. It's not like half now, half later. It's not like God has just given a deposit. It's a full redemption. That means it. That means a full redemption. It means there's nothing left to pay a full redemption. And he himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. And this is the, this is the true spirit of Christmas. This is why Jesus came. It's so that you can be set free from the slavery of your sin. You can be empowered to live a life of purpose, with freedom. That you can have the power and grace to wait well. And that you can pray praise not to take you out of the suffering and pain, but allow you to pass through it and get through it with strength and come out the other side stronger and transform. And it's in those places of pain that the, the moments of where God does the deepest work in our hearts. Maybe you're here today and you need, some, you need some fresh courage, some fresh hope in your life. Maybe you need to jump into that pool of mercy that I was speaking about. Maybe you need to make a a decision to make things right with Jesus and to come before Him and say, God, I've been trying to do this good list, bad list thing my whole life, but something has shifted in me and I want to, I want to live different from this day forward. So I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to pray for whatever it is that God is doing in your heart. And then we'll close out the morning, we'll sing again and then we'll be done for today. close our eyes God, there's many people in this room that feel like they're in this place of the depths out of the depths I cry out to you Lord it's calamity and chaos and things going on in our lives it feels like the deepest darkest place but God your word is good and true that even in that place you are attentive you hear our prayers, you hear our voices, you hear a cry for mercy. Lord, I pray as, as people in this room are reaching out to you now, that you would meet them at that place. They'll feel your comfort and your presence. But for those in the room who are, are, are battling with and grappling with the a record of past failures, of shortfalls and sins. I pray, Jesus, that you'll break the chains of that. That I'll walk out of here free. With you, there's forgiveness. I pray, God, for a restoration of people into purpose today. With you, there's forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. The 2024 is a year where there's nothing that's holding us back. That there's nothing, nothing that the enemy has to remind us of or accuse us of because we know that that's, has been dealt with with your finished work on the cross. God, I, I pray that you would teach us to be a people that wait well, like watchmen waiting for the morning, watchmen waiting for the sunrise, with a confidence and a certainty that we know it's gonna happen. So God, we put our hope in you and in your word. For with you, there's unfailing love, and with you, there's full redemption. And Jesus, you are the one who initiated all of this, and, and this is the... This is what we celebrate the most of all this Christmas season and every day of our lives, that you are the one who redeems us from all our sins. God, for those that are in the room that need to make right with you, God, I pray that in humility that your peace would come upon them, your, your love, your compassion, and your grace. Will you come, Holy Spirit? Jesus name I pray. Amen. 
Thank you for listening. Our prayer is that God will continue to speak to you and his power would be at work in your life.